I thank Deborah Gray White very much for bringing us together many years later. I was also at uh, that 1994 meeting at um, MIT, and it seems that it was um, only yesterday. It's hard to believe that uh, that many years have passed. Some people in this audience were in undergraduate school here at Rutgers uh, in, uh, in, in 1994. I had already been in the business, uh, I think, 20 years. I couldn't believe that either. <laughs> and I certainly can't believe that almost 20 more have passed. So it's, uh, it's, it, it's great to be uh, a part of, uh, of, this, of this conference, and also to Professor Wall for bringing the, uh, the English panel together. This project uh, that I'm going to uh, talk about today, or these remarks that I'm going to give today, represent the initial blush of an idea that looks forward to a, a theory of African-American women and the formation of that new republic that we would come to call the United States of America, which comes into being alongside the birth of the modern French state and the revolution of the black Jacobins, which will lead to the creation of the first black republic in the modern world, Haiti. In short, what I am attempting to do in this project, in the long haul, which won't be today, but in the long haul, is to contemplate the identity formation and the cultural historical apprenticeship of African American women in light of the imperatives of nation building. I'm pleased to have the occasion to share uh, some first thoughts here. It is proper to begin uh, this protocol with the words or a reminiscence of the words of Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Not only because he figures so preeminently in the founding of the United States, but also because he touches on this subject in crucial ways that reveal the boiling contradictions that moil around the center of the American nation state formation, reputed in gossip to have fathered the children of servant Sally Hemings. Jefferson apparently survives the vicious pen of one James Calender, the Richmond journalist who publicly circulates for the first time the story of a possible sexual liaison between Thomas Jefferson and his late wife's half-sister, Sally. From the first September 182 issue of the Richmond Recorder, this story passes along nearly two centuries of subterranean channels to end up on the desk of Professor Annette Gordon-Reed, who late in the 20th century and early in the 21st century has verified the ancient gossip, or we might say disciplined it, with the tools and resources of historiography in two texts that I'm sure this, the audience is familiar with, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, An American Controversy, and The Hemingses of Monticello, An American Family that just came out at the, toward the end of 08. In both these texts, Sally Hemings and her family at least earned the right to an official hearing. Put another way, Professor Gordon Reed's work accords as much significance to the Hemingses as historians have traditionally paid to Jefferson. But however much we might learn about Jefferson or the Hemings family, we are always dumbfounded all over again by the distance between Jefferson's conduct and his words. But this disparity is glaring only because of Jefferson's centrality to the American project. 
In Jefferson's Notes on the State of Virginia, 1785, the writer inscribes one of the most well-known passages from the Jeffersonian canon. He is addressing here the commerce between master and slave and the knowledges, and he acknowledges what he calls, quote, the most unremitting despotism on the one part and degrading submission on the other. Actually, Jefferson is tuning up to think that the black enslaved should have another country. As we hear in these words the kind of incipient sentiments that will lead to colonization efforts. But what Jefferson goes on to say in this paragraph of notes gags the senses when we think about his own role as a slaveholder. The execration, the execration, or the act of curse or of cursing with which the statesman who permits one half the citizens to trample on the rights of the other or the, the curses with which that person should be loaded echoes lines later in the same paragraph when Jefferson writes, indeed I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever, that considering numbers, nature, and natural means only, a revolution of the wheel of fortune and exchange of situation is among possible events that it may become probable by supernatural interference. The Almighty has no attribute which can take side with us in such a contest. Ranking in mnemonic power with the opening lines of the Declaration of Independence, these lines place Jefferson in a kind of prophetic alignment with the imminent American Revolution, the revolution in San Domingo, and farther down the road, Nat Turner's rebellion. In other words, the rhetorical Jefferson contains and sustains a seriously moral, perhaps even radical, dimension. We have no body of writings from Sally Hemings to bring alongside Jefferson's, nor apart from the fiction writers, starting with William Wells Brown's Clotel, or the president's daughter, called the first African-American novel, no way to easily form in the inner ear, an oral image of the sound and grain of Sally Hemings's voice, the shape and meaning of her words, or how she might have felt as the quintessential instance of the conversion on her own body of the racial and sexual practices that define slavery as the perdurable social logic of the late colonial regime and beyond. In fact, we are not helped toward an act of capable imagination regarding the actual Sally Hemings at all, how she looked, for instance, what France was like for an African-American teenager seeing another country, having or hearing all around her the constant hum and buzz of another language. The absence of intimate information, however, mimics the very subject or thematics of non-subjectivity that slavery's social arrangements attempted to reinforce. On the one hand, there are the modalities of being announced by discourse and in positions of discourse. And on the other, there are modes of being defined by their invisibility to this visibility, and it is in the interworkings of these spheres of existence that the Republic has its birth. It is only now that our histories can be written in the full particularity of the dialectical motion 
between visibility and invisibility and how one of these enables the other or how they are both mutually enabling. But what we have yet to factor into the picture is the play of gender and sexuality across the frame of this context. The reason why that is so has primarily to do with the historical attitude that regards the historical narrative as an exercise in propriety. By definition, propriety requires that dirt be anesthetized. And what goes along with the excision of defilement is male heroism or notions of highness in general. The movements in women's studies and black studies have made it possible to restore such subjects to their human and material status, though we still tend to think of the latter as alternative or counter histories that run along parallel lines to the official story. But bit by bit, the expunged knowledge of the alternative discourses works its way through the fabric of narratives that brings the national experience into view. In chapter 21 of William Wells Brown's Clotel, the author poses an allegory of slavery and freedom. And what he gives us are two ships that are in sight of each other, and that's what allegory makes it possible for you to do, to say things that uh, never actually happened in history, and things that are difficult to imagine are imagined uh, <clears throat> in the allegory. And this is just the piece of, of this chapter that um, that I want to read out to give you an idea of how this works, though I'm sure that for a lot of people this will simply be a review. On the last day of November 1620, on the confines of the Grand Bank of Newfoundland, lo, we behold one little solitary tempest-tossed and weather-beaten ship. It is all that can be seen on the length and breadth of the vast intervening solitudes from the melancholy wilds of Labrador and New England's iron-bound shores to the western coast of Ireland and the rock-defined Hebrides, but one lonely ship greets the eyes of angels or of men on this great thoroughfare of nations in our age. Next in moral grandeur was the ship to the great discoverers. Columbus found the continent. The Mayflower brought the seed wheat of states and empire. That is the Mayflower with its servants of the living God, their wives and little ones, hastening to lay the foundations of nations in the occidental lands of the setting sun. Hear the voice of prayer to God for his protection and the glorious music of praise as it breaks into the wild tempest of the mighty deep upon the ear of God. Here in this ship are great and good men, justice, mercy, humanity, respect for the rights of all. Each man honored as he was useful to himself and others, labor respected, law-abiding men, constitution making and respecting men, men whom no tyrant could conquer or hardly overcome with the high commission sealed by a spirit divine, etc. We also recognize that uh, Wells Brown is also a superb ironist and is very well aware of what he is setting up uh, in, these opening, uh, in these opening lines. And then on the other hand, but look far to the southeast and you behold on the same day in 1620, a low rakish ship hastening from the tropics, solitary and alone, to the new world. What is she? She is freighted with the elements of unmixed evil. Hark, hear those rattling chains. Hear that cry of despair and wail of anguish as they die away in the unpitying distance. Listen to those shocking oaths, 
the crack of the flesh cutting whip. Ah, it is the first cargo of slaves on their way to Jamestown, Virginia. Behold the Mayflower anchored at Plymouth Rock, the slave ship in James River. Okay. Now, whether or not that actually accords with uh, the historical facts about the arrival of uh, the first African persons uh, in Jamestown in 1619 is one thing, because according to the story that John Hope Franklin tells, slavery was not immediate in relationship to African peoples, that it was uh, an institution that evolved in the colonial uh, experience. But in any case, we see what uh, William Wells Brown is driving at in, in drawing uh, this, this contrast. So we, so we get then in this, in this allegory of slavery and freedom posed by way of, um, of this story in the novel, the ships that are involved and the relationships consequently that are involved in the transatlantic crossways and the oppositional rhetorical and imagistic moves that that entails. In the 25th chapter of the same work, Clotel, who was a fictional instance perhaps of an actual daughter of Thomas Jefferson, perhaps Harriet, by a black serving woman, is taken into custody and incarcerated after a foiled attempt to escape. Hotel is brought back to Richmond, but held in prison in Washington, D.C., and she finds herself in those interstitial spaces that a revised American history has brought to light. In this instance, Clotel's prison cell is located, quote, midway between the Capitol at Washington and the president's house. Caught crosswise among the currents of American political life, Clotel is not only Brown's idea of the contradictory logic of the American notion or the American project, but she remains the calculus to be explicated when we bring into the same sentences Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. This should be easy since this pair, historians now believe, and DNA makes quite probable, shared a bed. But the irony here is that bed sharing though fundamental to the universe of slavery and to the universe of the United States, has before now been a matter of embarrassment and repression. It is my view that bringing that repressed element into daylight will do a great deal and a great deal of good for the national ego. Thank you. 